Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about or surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the Arthur and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down now at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. What's interesting is that my intentions for the message I was going to bring uh, changed Sunday night. You all know what Sunday night, last Sunday night was? I don't know. It, I still don't understand the intrigue with sports. I don't. I know there's some of you that enjoy it, and I have no criticism of you. I really don't. But sports bore me. I'm just sorry. That's just the way it is. And if you enjoy it, that's fine. That's fine. But sports bore me. But last Sunday night found me sitting in my recliner watching sports. And I watched from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. That was the first football game I have ever seen in my 54 years of life. The first one I've actually watched from the beginning to the end. And as it got to the end, I was starting to understand the game a little bit. Just a little bit. To show you how ignorant my wife and I are of the game, let me tell you how our conversation went Sunday night. As we sat there watching this game. My wife would say, she'd, make, she'd have this more rhetorical question because she knew I didn't have the answer. And the question was this, well, why did they do that? And I'm sitting over there, I have no idea why they just did that. I have no, if you're at our house, if you like football, you have been laughing at us. And I'm there, I have no idea why they just did that. But I was intrigued by this game of grown, overpaid men chasing this little oblong brown thing up and down the field. It seemed like nobody could catch it. What the, what the goal or the purpose of the game is, I still don't quite know. But I was strangely intrigued last Sunday night. And I'm watching this going back and forth and back and forth. And people are cheering and, and, and they're going back and forth. And when it all ended, and there was an interview a news person took with a a player from Philadelphia. And out of that whole game, as I was just talking, if you love football and enjoy it and appreciate it more than I do, while I was talking, there were some plays that were coming onto the screen of your mind. Favorite plays, things that you're like, wow, you know, with me. Let me tell you what I remembered out of Sunday night. This is what I remembered. It was the interview after the game. You can tell I'm not much of a football fan, can you? Because the interview after the game, to this, she, she was interviewing this player, and he was sweaty. He was wore out. He was dazed. He was tired. And she asked, I don't even remember the question she asked him, but there, there's three words that came out of his mouth that I will never forget as long as I live. And those three words were, we are champions. And he didn't say it with assertiveness that I just said it. He said, we are champions. As if he didn't believe it. As if it was a shock to the system. As if he had been considered all of his playing life, however long or short that was, to be an underdog. He said, we are champions almost unbelievably. And my mind instantly went to Hebrews 12. We, wherefore, seeing we're also encompassed or brought around us is such a cloud of witnesses or champions. 
And my mind immediately sped to the day in which I will take my last breath on this earth. And my heart will have beat its last beat. And I stand before my Savior. And His arms are open wide. And He's grinning from ear to ear. He's laughing. And I look around. And around Him are millions on, upon millions of the saints that have gone before. And I see the apostles. And I see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Elijah, and Elijah. And I look at the face of my Savior. And unbelievably... That face I seen in that athlete is on my face. We are champions. We are champions. Oh, you know, in this life, it seems so often like we are the underdogs in the spiritual world. We are less than. The world tells you as a believer that you are less than. The devil kicks you when you're down. He tells you you're not going to make it. But I want to tell you on the authority of God's Word that if you're born again by the Spirit of God, that there are those in the heavens that have gone on before that are cheering, as it were, in the stands. And they're cheering on for you to make it. Oh, they see you fall. They see you trip and they see you tremble. They see your lips quiver with a, with, and your tears roll down your cheeks but they still cheer you on. Can you imagine the joy as you walk through those golden gates and you look at your Savior and you realize that you didn't make it on your own effort. You didn't make it because you're so strong. You didn't make it because you're so good. You made it because of Jesus Christ. You are, in Christ, a champion. Yeah, that's what, you know... You know I don't like football, if my mind went straight to that. But I was strangely intrigued as I realized, and I heard the news reports that the majority of the fans that were in Minneapolis, Minnesota, were from Philadelphia. That's what I heard. The majority Christian of your fans are in heaven right now. Betty's there jumping up and down. There's some people that have gone on before. People you love who you know without a shadow of a doubt that are believers. And they're jumping up and down and they're saying, go, go, go. Because rather you feel like it or not, if Christ is in you, you are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize. So run that you might obtain. Or run this Christian life that you might win. People of God, we are not in this life to just get a ticket that gives us an escape from hell. This life that we have been placed in by the person of Jesus Christ is, is one that, as I looked at that game Sunday night, and it, it looked like both teams were scratching and clawing to the very end to eke out another point, or whatever you call that. To eke out another point. And I thought, you try so hard to get that little brown thing from one side to the other. So hard. Scratching and clawing to get down there and then to somehow to get up. I don't understand what was going on. I heard the word touchdown and down and stuff like that. But it's moving this little brown thing around. You work so hard. And isn't that like the Christian life? Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he's saying, if you're going to run this race, he said, do it well. He says, put your whole being into it. Give up your whole being to the personhood of Christ. Find yourself lost in his presence, in, in his desire for you, in his will for you. Verse 25. And every man that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. 
Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But you do it to gain a crown that is incorruptible. If you were watching that game at the end of the game, you'd seen a picture of that Vince Lombardi trophy, didn't you? That little silver piece of cheesy trophy they brought out. And you've seen each player touch it. Ha, ha. It's a cheesy trophy. I don't care if it's made out of 100% silver, it's cheesy. But I'm telling you what, the trophy that is in store for you is incorruptible. It's eternal. It is in heaven, stored specifically for each one of you. God has promised it to you. You know the promise that he has given you until you obtain that trophy, that incorruptible trophy? It is his Holy Spirit. It says that he has placed within us his earnest, a down deposit, a proof that his promises are true. He says, and, and so I will put my Holy Spirit in, within you and you will know that heaven is real, that eternity is now, that I am real. Paul says in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 9, I therefore run, not uncertainly, so I fight, but not as one that beats the air. What Paul has said is, is I have a goal in mind. I know where I'm going. I'm not aimless. I'm not lost on my way. I know where I've come from. I know where I'm going. I am not uncertain. My gait, my walk, my pace is, is, is under the control of the Holy Spirit. I am going somewhere. I have a destination to go to. And he says, I do not box at nothing. <clears throat> Paul's saying, I'm not shadow boxing here at, at the imaginable. He says, I know what I am fighting for and striving for. Verse 27, 1 Corinthians 9. But I keep my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself would become a castaway. And you know how this relates to the game? I will guarantee you that almost every player of that game, when they hit the showers that night, had some kind of bruises on their body. They had to. That was a rough game. And so in our Christian life, we kick, we claw, we run, we have a destination in mind. And in it, there will be bumps. And in it, there will be bruises. And Paul is saying that even in my own body, who wants to do the things it wants to do, in disobedience and rebellion to God, I bring it under subjection. I beat, as it were, my body into subjection. That's radical. That's radical. We talked about controlling the tongue this morning in James. That's part of bringing my body under subjection to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to the control of the Holy Spirit. There is no victory that is ever won without resistance. Rather it be resistance from the outside or rather it be resistance from the inside. It doesn't matter. The battle is the same. But also the prize is also the same. It is Jesus Christ. And so as we fix our eyes on Christ, we can endure much suffering. We can endure more than we think we can. Because if we keep our eyes on Christ, He will give us the strength to walk the way in which He has appointed us to walk, to please Him in everything that we do. Philippians, Philippians 3, 8 to 10. Yea, doubtless, Paul's saying in Philippians 3, 8 to 10. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. But for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I do count them but dung, 
that I might win Christ. Oh, to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. You know, this life we go through is not a game, is it? not a game. You and I only get one crack at it. That's it. We get one crack at it. And the writer here in Philippians is saying, this writer did a lot of horrible things to the church of God. He persecuted the church of God. And God captured his heart on the road to Damascus. He captured it. And this man who was going this way turned around, and he went this way to the cross of Christ. And this, with the same determination that he persecuted the church of Christ, that same determination now was in his soul now, going this way. See, God doesn't often change our personality, our characteristics of our personality. What he does, he redeems it. He redeems it. And he sets us on a course in which where he wants us to be. A course that pleases him in all things. And so the writer in Philippians here is saying, he said, I was going this way, in which there was many things in my life that were important. He says, but now I'm going the way of the cross. He says, and now I'm telling you that everything in my life that the world around me thought was good, I now consider as dung, as manure. All my education that I got at the feet of the greatest teacher, Gamaliel, he says, I was a rabbi, I was born of the stock of Benjamin. This here, all these things, he says, that are my pedigree. That in the natural, in me being an enemy of the cross of Christ, me being an enemy of God himself, persecuting Christ daily, he says, all these things now are trash. I don't look behind. I look forward now by the grace of God, and I throw everything away except for the excellency of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as we walk this path, as we keep our eye upon the prize, our calling is that we might know him more intimately tomorrow than we do today. So that when we stand before his presence, (coughs) that we can hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So that as we enter and we step through that eternal portal, when our spirit is separated from our body, and we're absent from the body, but we're present with the Lord, we stand before our King and our Judge. And we see all the saints cheering us. And we realize that it's not that we got here of our own effort. But we got here because God has placed us in Christ. That it's his work in our life that has placed us on this pathway in which was so hard all my life. And yet now, I have the victory. May we, when we finish, may we finish well. And may... Our last words be as Paul's were in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Henceforth is there laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only to me only, but unto all those who are looking forward to his appearing.
May we be able to say that with conviction as we come to the end of our lives. I have fought a good fight. And I have finished my court, my course, what God has laid out in front of me. I have finished it to the best of my ability by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I have kept the faith. I encourage your heart. Let that be what's in your heart as you go through your Christian life. And I hope this morning that was an encouragement to you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, God, that we are champions. Oh, it's not anything we have done. Oh, Father, I know that. But God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Have you, how you have given it and how you have placed it within the life of every believer. That, Father, you have promised through your Son that you will never leave us, and neither will you forsake us. You have promised that you will be with us to the end. And then, Father, you have promised us strength for living. God, you have promised us life, not just a little bit, but fullness of life right to the end. Father, give us eyes of faith. That, Father, we see our lives not as lives that are cast down, not as lives that are depressed, not as lives, oh God, that are defeated. But, Father, give us eyes of faith to be able to see, oh God, what you see. To be able to see what those cloud of witnesses, oh God, see. When they look from the balconies of heaven, O oh God. Lord, give us strength to fight this fight with certainty, God. Keeping our eyes, O oh God, on the prize. For God, we are weak people, O oh God. We have a tendency, God, to give up. We have a tendency, God, to let off. We have a tendency, O oh God, to become discouraged. And then, Father, also, give us the ability to look, Father, beyond our own selves, O oh God. To look at the lives of others, to encourage others, to, to lift them up. Where, O oh God, they might be weak. God, place within us a wellspring of water, springing up unto life eternal, O oh God. Father, give us life for death, O oh God by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that you are faithful and that, God, you answer prayer. And that we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Come let us adore